some of you may have noticed, some of you may not have noticed yet, um, but there are um, there's more seats available this morning. That's not because the attendance is necessarily way lower, um, but um, we have now put all the chairs back. We are now at pre-COVID church seating. Yay! I know that's really not a huge deal, um, but it feels like sort of a, uh, a milestone uh, where we have 150 chairs in the room now, and uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there have been several weeks uh, in the last couple months uh, where it's been a little cozy. So um, we brought all the chairs uh, back in. Uh, we still have uh, some room for people to spread out a little bit as much as they want. Um, so um, communion guys, when you get ready to serve, let me you know just encourage you to remember that there's, there's two sides of the aisle. Take a half on, on either side of you, uh, especially here in the middle. You don't need to go roaming very far. Just, you know, three in and three out, three in and three out. And it'll be, it'll be great. Um, uh, we are still not collecting offering. We have boxes uh, at the back doors. If you'd like to uh, give a gift today, you can certainly do that. Grab one of the envelopes in a chair pocket uh, and then put, uh, put your gift in the box at the back doors when you leave. You can give electronically uh, if you'd like. There are links on the website and our newsletter to do that. Um, if you are a guest, we have no expectation that you will give uh, a gift today. We want this to be our gift to you. Um, uh, giving financially is something that church family does. Um, thank you for supporting our ministry here uh, for God's work in, uh, in the kingdom. The 119th Psalm is the prayer of one who delights in and lives by God's sacred word. You probably have heard 119.11 that says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We must hide God's word in our hearts to keep us from sin and to show us our path through life. If you need a copy of God's word so you can do that, um, please take one of the Bibles from a, a chair rack near you. Uh, we do have um, uh, uh, a sermon series going on. We've been working, uh, talking about holding on to hope uh, for the last several weeks. <clears throat> uh, in Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, he mentions hope uh, many, many times. Um, we've talked about the hope we have in the resurrection, uh, the hope and the unlimited power of God, hope in the certainty of peace with him, uh, and uh, hope in the glory of heaven coming to us. Last week, we talked about the hope that we have in his revealed word. Uh, and certainly in a time where there is so much despair, when there's so much chaos, so much surrender, um, so much darkness and hopelessness, we all desperately need the hope that comes from God, that joyful and confident expectation of God's promises to us. We're going to continue uh, in, in that series this morning. We're wrapping up the Romans part of it today, uh, but we still have uh, two or three more sermons in, in this series um, before we finish up. Uh, back back, back uh, earlier in the year, I would wrap up every uh, worship service with Paul's benediction and prayer uh, from Romans 15, 13. It'll sound familiar. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a great prayer. Uh, and uh, as it focuses so much on hope, uh, that's where we're going to be focusing our, our time this morning. Romans 15, 13 is not the last verse in the book of Romans, but it is the last verse um, that is in the main body of the letter. After uh, verse 13, it's more about personal greetings and um, sort of touching on a few things that he's already talked about, uh, but 
but 1513, I believe, is kind of the exclamation point, um, the, the, last, the last nail um, in, um, in, in the Roman letter. And that makes it, I think, fairly important for us to pay attention to. Um, in 1513, Paul offers a prayer for the fullness of spiritual benefits that come from hearing, believing, and receiving the gospel of God's grace. If you have not recently read through the book of Romans, uh, you, you would do well to do that. Uh, and you'll see that that letter over and over again um, drives home the importance of the gospel message, that it is not just for a few, but it is for all. The gospel message is not about law. It is about God's grace and his unending love. And in this one verse, Paul ties together five big ideas from the preceding 15 chapters, which we're going to talk about this morning. Hope, joy, peace, faith, and power. <clears throat> so let's talk first about Paul's prayer for faith. How does faith come? Where do, we, where do we get it? Well, Paul tells us in the book of Romans that it is through the good news, through the preaching of the gospel message, that faith comes. In Romans 10, verse 17, he says, faith comes through hearing, uh, comes, from, comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. No one can believe in Christ Jesus unless they've been told about him. That's really not a very profound statement. But I'm not sure that we fully realize it all the time. How can anybody believe in Jesus unless, unless they have heard about him? If you are a follower of Jesus, you've got to tell people about the change that he has made in you and the change that he can make in them as well. Just so you know, your ability to do that, your willingness to do that, your, um, your execution of that mission does not mean that people will automatically accept the truth. Not everyone who hears the message will believe it. Not everyone who hears the message will accept it. But our role is to share it so that other people can come to faith in Christ. Back at the beginning of the letter, Paul said, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. Faith comes through hearing the message about Christ Jesus. We believe, our faith is that Jesus is the only Son of God, that He came to reveal God's will to us, that He came to pay the penalty for our sin through His death on the cross, and that He brings us hope for new life through His resurrection. There is no other way to escape sin and eternal death, only Jesus. He is the only way to new life. That's what we believe. That's what we proclaim. Paul prays for us to have faith to proclaim that message so others can have that same saving faith. Paul also prays for peace. Uh, we talk about peace, we sing about peace, we hear about peace, it's on the news. Um, most of us just assume that peace is the absence of fighting or conflict. That's, that's weak. Um, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot, whatever sort that may be. It's a Christian definition of peace. It can also be the objective state of being reconciled to God. 
It's true. It's measurable. We're made right with him again. And it, it is about an attitude of inward tranquility, rest and release, freedom from worrying about our salvation. Peace is not just about can't we all just get along? Can't, can't we just stand before God and not be too afraid? That's not the peace that Paul prays for. He prays that we would have overflowing peace, abundant peace, knowing that peace can only come from having faith in, trusting God. You know somebody who is full of anxiety and worry and fear and unsettledness? They really need to figure out how to trust God. We can have overflowing, abundant peace about our future, Paul says. We know that those who believe in Christ Jesus and who have responded accordingly can have no fear of the future. They don't have to worry that they'll die on a good day. Any day is a good day to meet their Savior. We know that the blood of Jesus secures our salvation. And if we are faithfully following him, we don't need to fear death. We don't need to fear eternity. We can embrace it. But Paul also prays for peace that to have an impact on our relationship with other believers. Um, earlier in the letter, he in chapter 12, verse 18, Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I know I have quoted that verse a number of times in the last 30 years of ministry. As far as it is up to you, live at peace with everyone. And I think most people would assume, well, sometimes that's not up to me. Your response is always up to you. How you deal with whatever happens Whoever you encounter, that is entirely up to you. Peace does depend on you. A parent might tell their child, I don't care how they treated you. What matters most is how you treat them. Peace is about our response. It is about our reaction. Someone treats us badly, we do not repay it with more bad behavior. We try to live at peace. And if it is not possible because somebody is hostile or a bully or abusive, we need to make space. That's not in the text. That's James the dad talking to you. Okay? Paul prays that we will have peace, peace about our future and peace with those with whom we worship. He also prays for our joy. One of the descriptions in the New Testament of the followers of Jesus is that they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 13, verse 52. Paul prays that God would fill every single believer with any kind of joy and every kind of joy as they trust in him. Um, that's what the language literally means. Each and every kind of joy. Now, joy is not happiness. You can be joyful and not have a grin on your face. You can be joyful and not have butterflies and bluebirds circling your head as you walk through rainbows all day long. Joy is an interior attitude, a state of mind. Um, somebody has called it inward delight that keeps us excited about being a follower of Jesus and about being covered by the freedom that Christ's death brings. There's a firm resolve that changes our perspective on everything that is in front of us. It is about having a changed life. There are so many people who really want to be happy. Well, I'm not happy in my marriage. I'm not happy at work. I'm not happy at home. I'm not happy with my health. I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I'm not happy. But joy is, a, is more than just 
um, your, your perspective on your circumstances. I think for most people, in order for them to really be happy, everything has to be good. Everything has to be great. Um, everything is a, a positive circumstance. But joy isn't like that. It is really only as a follower of Christ that we can have real delight, real joy, um, jubilation, no matter what the circumstances may be. If we are filled with joy, we can be singing praise to God from the depths of a prison cell, like the Apostle Paul did. Uh, We can happily sing our way to the gallows or deal with the diagnosis or endure the treatment knowing that because we trust God, he has promised that he will never leave us alone. We will always be with him. Let me make sure you understand the nature of Paul's prayer here. Paul is not praying that if God can, would he maybe somehow Figure out how to give you and me abundant joy. This is not like a a, a birthday wish kind of a prayer. You know, God, if you can get around to it, if it's not too much of a hassle, and if, if if you're capable of it, could you please give your people joy? Because he can and he does. The prayer is that God's people would cultivate God's joy in their own lives. And it is only through trusting God, having faith in him, that we can really have overflowing joy. To quote a phrase that I absolutely detest, he's got this. I I hate that. Don't say that around me. You'll make me grouchier than I am, right? But it is true. God does have this. God has got everything under control. He's on the throne, and and you're not. So relax and enjoy his presence. Paul prays that we would know joy that comes through trusting Christ Jesus. He also prays for hope. There are two aspects of the blessing of hope um, that sort of arise from, from this verse. Um, The first way that we have hope is, again, hope has been defined as that joyful confidence of expectation. Uh, We have hope that peaceful, joyful confidence about our present relationship with God through Christ Jesus. We have hope because we know he's with us. We're in the middle of the relationship with him. Hope is not a flimsy, wispy wish that might, maybe, possibly come true. Hope in the Bible is concrete. We are his and he is ours. We have hope in our relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And the second thing is that we have a joyful expectation of an incredible eternal future when Jesus returns and takes us home forever. That is really the essence of hope. With great joy, we remain faithful to the one who has done so much for us and has given us so very much, including a reason to keep moving and to keep growing in him. Buckets of hope, overflowing fountains of hope rain down on us as we trust him. Here in this passage, Paul calls God the God of hope, meaning that he is the source of everything that can bring us hope. He inspires it and he imparts it. He distributes it to his children. We trust him. And so he can be counted on to fill up whatever is lacking in us, including hope. Okay, Paul prays for um, for faith, for peace, for joy, and for hope. And in case you've missed it somehow, Paul's prayer isn't just that we would have a little peace or a bit of joy or some hope. Paul prays that we would be filled to overflowing 
with these amazing blessings. Uh, as our faith develops and increases in our life, so will hope and joy and peace. And the only way that we can grow in these areas is through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is Paul's last part of the prayer. Paul prays for power. Paul prays that the followers of Christ will overflow. Um, it can mean abound. It can mean to excel in the hope of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' people, you and I should be known for our hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my question as I was working this week was, well, what has the Holy Spirit done? What, what is it promised that he will do in us and for us? And so I made a list. This is not by any means a complete list, uh, but I believe it is a powerful one. Let's sort of look at a handful of things that the Holy Spirit does in, uh, in God's Word. Uh, we'll start at the beginning of the Gospels. The Holy Spirit is the one who brought about the birth of Jesus. That's in Matthew 1.18 and Luke 1.35. Mary conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as Jesus grew, the Holy Spirit directed him during his ministry, that's Luke 4, 14, and enabled um, things like the casting out of demons in Luke eleven twenty. 20. The Holy Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead and brings new life to us. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come to his disciples that he would remain a constant companion and that he would remind them of all of Jesus' teaching and the Holy Spirit would give them power and direction for their ministry. That's Luke 24, verse 49 and John 14. Uh, also, oh, oh, uh, right along with that, we read in... Uh, uh, Luke 12, 12, that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say. When we have to speak and we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will provide the right words. He gives the right words and also the will and power to share the good news of Jesus with others. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 8 uh, and uh, chapter 4, verse 3. If we will live um, daily with the company of and the direction of the Holy Spirit, that will keep us obedient to God, which will keep us um, from ungodly, unhealthy desires that will hurt us. That's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. And right along with that, the Holy Spirit produces godly traits in us like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit is our intercessor. He carries our prayers to God even when we don't have the words to express ourselves, when we don't know what else to say, all we can do is groan. The Holy Spirit carries our prayers to our Father. And the last one on my list this morning is that the, the Holy Spirit is the seal and the guarantee of our eternal inheritance with God. That's Ephesians 1. Verses 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit is busy. He is powerful. He is essential to our lives as Christ followers. And it is only through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, His, um, His living inside of us, his filling us up, his changing us. We have to invite him to come in and do those things 
to invade our hearts and lives to help us become the men and the women that God has designed us to be. One thing about the Holy Spirit is that he is not pushy. He will not force his way into your life. He will not break down the door of your heart, mind, and soul to come in. He has to be invited to come in. He can have some influence on us from the outside. He can kind of push us in the right directions. But it's not until we ask him to come into our hearts, to change us, that he can really do his work. We believe here that it is through faith, through belief, through confession of Christ as Lord, through repentance, changing of our direction to God's path, and baptism, that God's Holy Spirit brings us God's forgiveness and then comes to live inside of us. If you want to talk about what your next steps in faith are, I hope that you'll come and talk to me, you'll come talk to Zach or one of our other church leaders today. But if you're ready to make a public declaration of your faith in Jesus for the first time, if you're ready to be baptized into Christ, we're going to pray. And as we pray, I'd invite you to come and meet me right up here in the front. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful um, for um, this prayer of, of Paul's uh, for so many years ago. It helps us to understand what your will is and, and how we should be. Father, we pray that we would be filled with faith and not just some sort of head knowledge about who you are, but that faith would change us, it would drive us every day, um, that we would be uh, growing constantly in, in areas like hope and peace and joy. And Father, we pray that through your Holy Spirit that um, you would draw us ever closer, that you would help us to grow more deeply in our faith, that you would uh, push us out of our safe little boxes, out into the world to share what we believe about Jesus. We know that other people can only believe as we share with them. So Father, we, we ask and pray um, that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would change us. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you'd like to talk some more about your next steps, please uh, come find me today. Let's talk about uh, what, what your next move is. <clears throat> uh, that would bring us to our time of communion this morning. <clears throat> uh, Zach is going to come and share a few thoughts about communion. Uh, while, uh, while he comes, if I could also have four men to come uh, and uh, distribute the elements uh, to those uh, who are here this morning. Uh, if you're at home, please be sure to get your bread and grape juice ready as well so you can partake with us. For us. And what that means is something honestly more profound than we could ever imagine. That in the moment when Christ became sin, the Father looked away, not because he didn't have the stomach to watch, but because he is a holy, perfect Father that could have nothing to do with sin. And in that moment, Christ was sin. And for the first time, in our universe's history and before our universe's history in all of history the whole the holy trinity was split because christ became sin and he did that for you for me um, sinners that are without hope that were without hope before christ sacrificed himself on the cross so that we might become the children of god that we might inherit 
the kingdom of God and live with him for all of eternity. So today, as we take the elements, I just ask that you would not let this sacrifice be vain in your life. Don't let it be vain in your life. What I mean by that is don't let Christ's sacrifice go without a response from you. Repent and believe the gospel today so that his sacrifice isn't in vain in your life, so that you can really take a hold of what he did on the cross. As we take this bread and body in a minute, as we take this bread which symbolizes the body and the juice which symbolizes the blood in a minute, let us remember that perfection became sin for us. As you're taking it, remember that perfection became sin for you. Mark's account of the Last Supper in, 14, in chapters 14, verse 22 to 25 says, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, Take this, this is my body. After this, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Amen. I pray that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk and grow in your faith with Jesus while we've been together today. I'll close our live stream today with words from Paul to the Roman Christians. It's the same chapter James is reading from today. Chapter 15, verse 5 through 6. May the God who gives you, who gives endurance and encouragement, give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind, and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll see you again soon. While the band comes to lead us in a few more songs for worship, let me remind, me, let me remind you to fill out a colored connection card from the chair rack in front of you if you have not done so or if you're new, so that we can stay in contact and drop in the offering box on your way out, especially if you have anything that you need prayer for anything that you'd like to talk to us about. Uh, I would really also like to meet you guys out by the fireplace. James and I will be out there, and we have a gift for anyone that's new, uh, if this is your first time worshiping with us today. So come say hi. We're just right outside. Before I ask you all to stand up, uh, I, will, I will ask that um, the three...